I could give you some pointers. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, a football field is 100 yards long, but it's a game of inches. Of mere inches. Because football ain't a sport. Football is a art. And it's all in the fundamentals. Like blocking and tackling. Suppose I have this little problem to tackle. What I need to do is block it. Then we put the hammer down and hold that line. Yep, the right tool for the right job and a firm belief in the fundamentals. Yeah, remember that cold, rainy night when Coach Braswell walked up to the bench I was warming and says, Crazy legs, what we need is a mirror. Coach Braswell always knew who to call on when there was a tough job to be done. Crazy, he'd say. He always called me crazy. I love those movies as a kid. I don't know about you. Where'd they go? The innocence of those movies, right? <laughs> Ernest was always creating so much more work for himself because he would just ignore the problem. He would just, he would just put Band-Aids on him, and it was just causing, causing more and more issues for himself, wasn't he? Well, I've got a personal story like that about a time that my life was actually put in danger because somebody ignored a major problem. Back when I was, I was probably still a teenager, a bunch of us were gathered together, and we were trying to figure out where we were going to go to relocate the group, and so we all piled into each other's cars, and we were, we were going somewhere else, and, and an acquaintance, some guy I just met, said, hey, you want to ride with me? I said, sure. Well, looking back and thinking about the death trap of a car that he had, I probably shouldn't have gotten in. Anyway, got in the car, and, and we're driving down the road, and boom, the car started getting real squirrely, and he got it stopped and pulled over, and I remember what he said to me. He said, the tire finally blew. So, what do you mean the tire finally blew? So we, we get out of the car and pop the trunk and had to sift through the sea of fix-a-flat cans. To get to the spare tire. To only find that we didn't have a jack to change the tire. And I, and I said, what is going on with all of these fix-a-flat cans? And he said, well, all I've been doing is spray a little fix-a-flat in the tire, add some air, and I could just keep going further with this tire. And I'd, he, he, I guess he was doing this for quite some time, and it, and it just so happened that that day while I was in his car, the tire blew. 
the common, the common theme between the video and my story is that there were issues that weren't dealt with properly. And, and a pipe blew, a tire blew, and they could have just been fixed right. Do any of us have things in our lives that we just slap Band-Aids on and, and we keep going and they just resurface? Wives, please don't raise your husband's hand with that question. Just because you ask us to do something doesn't mean you need to remind us six months later to do the job. We, we, know, we know that we have things that we need to do. We know that there's things that need to be dealt with. You've asked us once. Don't remind us again. But we have those things in our lives that we just put Band-Aids on. Um, when you came in and, and we were singing this morning, uh, you notice probably that uh, the songs today were pretty worship-based. They were pretty worship-based. We're in uh, week number five of Vision 23, and today's message or today's sermon name is worship. Today we're going to be talking about worship, but the big idea that we're going to be talking about today is dealt with. Dealt with. Things that we need dealt with in our lives. And before we jump in and talk about the connection between worship and dealt with, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for Sunday again that we can meet together as a family in this church, this family, this body of Christ, Lord, that you have gathered together. Lord, worship is such a big, integral part of, of being part of your body and being able to serve you and grow. Lord, I ask as we dig deep into this subject, deep into uh, the subject of worship and dealing with those things in our lives, Lord, I ask that you would just open our hearts and our minds and that we would um, uh, be able to answer these tough questions and walk away today with a better sense of worship for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For years, worship is something that I really struggled with. I really struggled with worship because I didn't know coming into church what my response, what the proper response to worship was. Um, I, I would come into church and I would look around and I felt like people in the church were, were having a better or easier time during the worship part of the service. Typically, every church does this. They'll have worship as the first part like we just had, and then the, and then the, the pastor would get up and, and have the sermon, right? I would look around, and it's like you've got, you've got, the, you've got the, the Pentecostal look like this, right? And then you've got, you got the, the Christian church look like this. So it's like, are they halfway into worship? And then, and then of course, you've got the Baptist, you know, right? So it's like I could pick on us because we're all together, right? But it's like what is proper, what is the right way to do it? So I would sometimes find myself singing along and think, did I shut the coffee pot off before I got here? Did I forget to feed the dog? Um, it's tax season, isn't it? So many things were cruising through my mind other than worship. Please tell me I'm not the only person that does that. Okay. And so I would get so frustrated. I'm the only one. Is that what you said? Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm like, really? Somebody else take over this sermon right now. I'm done. I quit. So, so I would get so frustrated with myself because worship time would come and go, and then I would think, I've got to wait till next Sunday to get my worship on. And then I would work myself up to, okay, get in the right frame of mind, get in the right frame of mind, and then it would happen again to me. And so, today, I want to address that. I want to talk about what worship is. It turns out that God has a lot to tell us about worship, and we're going to spend the majority of our time in John, chapter 4. We're not going to read through it right now, but you can find your place in the Bible there, John, chapter 4, and then we're going to spend a little bit of time in Romans, uh, chapter 12, a little bit later. 
There's a lot of scripture we're going to read today. I usually put all of the verses up on the screen, but that was just going to be way too many slides. So if you don't have your Bibles with you today, there are some Bibles under the seats, and I believe it can be found on page 752 if you don't have your Bibles with you. But Jesus left us a powerful story of an interaction that he had with a Samaritan woman at the well, and that's what we're going to be reading through today. Now, I want to give you a little bit of a backstory of what was happening there before we read it. The history of the Samaritans date back to 721 BCE. Um, in, the, in the northern area, and I think I've got a map in my slides, if we can bring that up. Okay. Uh, in 721 BCE, resulting from an exiling of Hebrews in the northern kingdom of Israel, what happened was the, um, there were some Hebrews that were, that were left over in the northern part of, of the area. And the Assyrians, when they, when they went into the northern area, the, the intermarrying that happened resulted in the Samaritan people. Now, we talked, uh, uh, maybe it was about a month ago in Nehemiah, when the rebuilding of the walls happened in Jerusalem. Uh, when the Hebrews started returning and there was the feuding going on between the people, that would have been the Samaritans. In 600 BCE, when the Babylonians came in to take over, they, that was the end of the Assyrian reign. Well, what happened was that Jesus and his disciples were down in uh, Judea, or down in Jerusalem area, which is about, about 40 or 60 clicks south of the flowers right there. Well, the, um, uh, the Pharisees caught wind that the, Jer that the uh, disciples were baptizing more than John the Baptist at the time. And they said, okay, we're going to go and check this out. Jesus caught wind of it and said, no, we need to head north to Galilee. And so in order to get there, he needed to cross through Samaria. The Samaritans and the Jews did not get along well, but they needed to cross through that territory. On their way through, they stopped at Sychar in Samaria, and that's where the well is located. And so we're going to pick up in John chapter 4, verse 7. Jesus stops at the well, and the rest of the disciples went into town. To get some food. Verse 7. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her. Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone on their way to get some food. The Samaritan woman said to him. How is it that you a Jew. Ask for a drink. From me a, Samar a woman from Samaria. For Jews had no dealings. With the Samaritans. Now, as I explained before, that there was kind of a feud that had happened between them. So it was very, very uh, not normal for the two of them to meet. But it was also not normal for a Samaritan woman to be at the well during that day. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later and why she was even there. But it was very hot during the day. And he asked her for something to drink. Jesus answers in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God... And who it was saying this to you, give me a drink. You would, have to, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well to drink from, and he drank from it himself and his sons. And his livestock. First of all, I want to point out that this well would have been about 1,800 years old. If Jacob dug the well, it was about 1,800 years old. So if you get a new well dug in this area, make sure that you ask the well digger if he gives you the Jacob guarantee. That if you can have an 1,800-year-old well. That's a, a very old well. But I've got uh, John 10, 11, and and I've got the New Living Translation up here because I like how it's worded better. If you only knew the gift God has for you and you were 
and you knew who you're speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. This is the first hint. I want us to, to make note. This is hint number one that Jesus gives to her of who he actually is. Hint one, I am not just a Jewish man. I am somebody more. I am God. And I am offering you living water. Right now, the Samaritan woman has no idea who she's talking to. This is just a guy that stopped and wanted something to drink. That's who Jesus is to her right now. But there was something else that caught my eye when I was reading this. She asked him, are you better than Jacob? Are you better than Jacob who dug this well? Jacob provided the water in the well. Jacob dug the well, and because of that, she was able to get water. Let's, let's translate that to today. Jesus, are you better than my job that provides the money that's in my bank account? Jesus, are you better than what I have physically that is providing all of my needs right now? Because right now, that well that she's drawing water from is providing the needs that she has at that very moment. So she's asking Jesus, are you better than the ancestors that gave me what I need this very moment? That's the question she just asked. And so we do that all the time now. Is there something, Jesus, that you can give to me that I don't already have? And that's what she asked him. Let's continue reading. We're going to go on to verse 13. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come back here to draw water. Hint number two. Jesus says it again. What I'm going to give to you is eternal. Jesus is not talking about the physical water in this well. What I have to give to you is something that you cannot provide yourself. John 4.15. Let's focus on, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come to draw this water. She's still talking about the physical water. She can't get her mind away from this well. But what she's asking for is simplicity in life on this earth. She doesn't want to have to physically draw water from this 75-foot well. And imagine a well that's 1,800 years old. It can't be the greatest water. Imagine the things that are down in it. Imagine how hard she has to work to get it out. Think about that. Imagine our jobs are not awesome all the time. Lord, can I just win the lottery already? Please. Lord, I'm tired of working on this jalopy car I've got. Can't I just get a new one? We do that. We pray those things. Lord, make my life easy on earth. She's still focused on one thing right now, quenching that physical thirst. Like Dee had mentioned with the kids up here, she held up a jug of water, physical water. That will quench physical thirst just like the well that the Samaritan woman is talking about. If you've got your notes in front of you under point number one this morning, don't allow our earthly problems to cause spiritual problems. Don't allow earthly problems to cause spiritual problems. Her earthly issues, her issues of physical thirst, we're blinding her at this point. She's not seeing what's going on. Jesus had been nice about it to this point. He'd been, he'd been very subtle. He'd been nice about it. Now he's ready to take his gloves off. And that's, that's how Jesus operates all through Scripture, and I love it, because Jesus is always very subtle about things. Then he's like, all right, let's get right down to business. Let's... let's Talk about brass tacks here. In verse 16, Jesus says to her, go call your husband to come here. Go call your husband to come here. The woman, woman answers him, I have no husband. Jesus says to her, you're right in saying that you have no husband. 
for you have had five husbands. And the one that you're with now is not your husband. What you have said is true. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is a place for worship. Let's pause there for a moment. Ouch. Ouch. Imagine being called out in person by Jesus. Like you've been ignoring what he's had to say, and then boom. This. This is what is in your life. This is your junk. This is why you can't see me. This is what you haven't dealt with. And she still doesn't see it. She just wants to sidestep the whole conversation and start talking about worship. Like, well, my ancestors worshiped on this mountain here, and you're telling me that we've got to go worship over in, in Jerusalem. Let's translate that to today. Well, I, I was born and raised in this church, so I've got to worship here. And you're telling me that I can't go worship in that church over there? So, I, I mean... If I've got to worship, I've got to worship here. And, well, I was told that I can't take communion in your church because I'm not a member over there. I had a conversation with a friend of mine that said that I'm not welcome to take communion in his church because I'm not a member of his church. So we're still kind of, we're still doing that today. <laughs> and Let's continue on to verse 21 because this is what Jesus has to answer her with. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you, will you worship the Father. Your worship, you will worship, you worship what you know. We worship, or you, you worship what you do not know, we worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming and is not here, or is now here, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus warned her twice there that the hour is coming. The hour is here. Jesus is him. In our notes under point number two, it is not where we worship, it is how we worship. I'll say that again. It is not where we worship, it is how we worship. So when I struggled years ago that I was not able to worship well during our worship set on Sunday morning, it is not where I worship, it is how I worship. Worship is not Sunday morning. Worship is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It is all the time. It is all the time. There were things in this woman's life that was not dealt with. And they were clouding her vision. She had Jesus right in front of her and couldn't see him. He said, look at me. Do you see me? And so I want to ask you, church, what is it that you haven't dealt with? I'm not asking you to, to blurt those things out, but this is for you to think about what is it in your life that you have not dealt with? What is it that keeps you from seeing Jesus, who is right in front of you, saying, I am the way? Now, as a boy... Even as a born-again Christian, we have those things that cloud our worship daily. And when I think about worship, we have to think about who God is. And, and God knew that we would have such a problem thinking about the character of God that he sent his son as a baby to grow up as a as a man in the flesh on earth so that we could get a true depiction of who God is. So we could study the
the character of Jesus. And when we look at the character of Jesus and look at who we are, we can see what a massive gap there is. And when we can focus on the character of who God is and who we are, we know, we know how desperately we need Jesus. We know how desperately we need Jesus. Paul told us this in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Said, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God that will be acceptable and perfect. Even as Christians, us in the church, bodies of the, or, or members of the body of Christ, we, trans, or we find ourselves conforming to the world all the time. Why? Because we live in it. We work in it. We play in it. It is so easy to have junk in our lives that we just haven't dealt with. We haven't dealt with it, and it gets in the way of, of worship. We come in here. And we find ourselves not being able to focus and not being able to worship our Lord and Savior because we just have junk. We just have junk, just like the woman at the well. Maybe you struggle with worship, not only on Sunday morning, but in general. You struggle with worship because you just have that, that one thing in your life. Or maybe it's multiple things. I didn't plan it this way, but it worked out so perfectly. There's, there's one time a month in this church that we have the opportunity to have a special worship, and that's Communion Sunday. That is a special time when we get to celebrate what Jesus did on the cross for us, that we get to share the breaking of bread and the drinking of the cup, celebration of what Jesus did on the cross. And every time that we have communion, we have that time that we can take before the Lord the stuff that hasn't been dealt with. And it says that in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that we are to examine ourselves before we, before we take communion. That we are to examine ourselves. If you've noticed in your bulletins and around, there are pieces of white paper. And so today we're going to do something a little different. Is I want everybody to take this piece of paper out. And there's pens in the backs of the seats. And maybe you've got your own pen. Is I want you to think about one thing, one word that represents that thing. It could be a sin. Maybe it's not a sin, but it's something that is getting in the way of your worship. And write that word down there. Put no names on there. This is anonymous. It could be pride. It could be forgiveness. It could be whatever that word is. But write it down on this piece of paper. And then fold it in half so that nobody can read what it is. Then what we're going to do when you're done with that is I've got push pins up here next to the cross and we're going to tack that to the cross everybody's going to tack these white papers to the cross because what you haven't dealt with in your life has already been dealt with on the cross it's already there we can forget about it they're done So as you're thinking about it, as you're filling them out, when you're ready, come on up. And go ahead and put them on the cross. We're going to leave them there. The deacons are going to come forward. They're going to grab the elements for communion today. And they're going to do something a little different. They're just going to spread out 
in the front of the stage here. And when you're done, come on down and grab the elements for communion from the deacons. Now, if you're unable to come up and do this or would rather just stay seated, the deacons would be happy to come and take the piece of paper and tack it up for you and bring you the elements of communion.
final point this morning is a life focused on Christ will naturally create worship, produces natural worship. Whenever we are focused on him, worship just happens. It's not something that we have to force. We don't have to try it. We don't have to get frustrated when it doesn't happen. When we walk with him, we worship him. When Jesus was surrounded the table with his disciples, he knew it was it was the end. And it says in 1 Corinthians 11:23, the Lord Jesus on the night Before he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he gave thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant, my blood. Do this often when you drink it in remembrance of me. God, thank you for this time that we can worship you. Thank you for what you did on the cross for us, for breaking your body for us, for shedding your blood for us, for our sins. Lord, I ask as we as we leave today, Lord, that that we would just remember that worship is a is a never ending thing. It is a is it, it, it is something that we do as often as we breathe that we breathe worship for you. Jesus, we love you, and we worship you. Amen.
Father God, thank you once again for this time. Lord, I want to pray over all of these slips that are up on this cross. Lord, there are some hurts, habits, and hang-ups in this room that multiply even bigger than these slips on the cross. Lord, you know them. You know all of them individually. I pray, Lord, that as we leave today, that, that there would be peace that you would take away the junk that gets in the way of our worship, Lord. Thank you once again for what you have done on the cross, and thank you that those slips are not even there. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.